Thank you, Rashad Imam, for a comprehensive presentation. I know it must be, mustn't be easy. Actually, it's quite difficult to cover such a specialized area of law in 15 minutes. To summarize, what Rashad has stated is that in order to enforce contractual disputes, the realm or the forum is that of the civil courts. Unless a litigant can uh, invoke Article 102.1 and Article 102.2 of our Constitution. Invoking Article 102.1 requires showing breach of fundamental rights. As Rashad has pointed out, we generally see this mainly in administrative employment contracts. The scope of Article 102.2 is wider. The scope has been widened since the 1986 case of Sharping to all the way to the 2003 case of Asaduzzaman Shikdar, both appellate division cases. What Rashad Imam says is that the scope should be further widened, if I may use the word, as he has, Judicial activism is, requ is required. Why? For timeliness and for effective dispute resolution mechanism. So that the High Court Division becomes the court of first instance instead of the civil courts. He has also said, he has also pointed us to the World Bank's ease of business report. And he has pointed out that we rank 179th out of 180 countries. He stated that this must be improved. Now we move on to the panel. We have actually just about 35 minutes left for this session. So I would suggest we take 30 minutes for the panel discussion if our esteemed panelists agree and keep five minutes for the question. And with that, I would now like to introduce our esteemed panelists. First, if I may call on stage the Honorable Mr. Justice Mirza Hussain Haider, Judge of the Appellate Division, Supreme Court of Bangladesh. <laughs> Sir was elevated in 2001 and has above 17 years of experience in serving as a judge of the Supreme Court. We are immensely grateful for Sir's presence today at this session especially because Sir has undergone eye surgery just last week. <laughs> Next, I would like to call on stage one of the most empowering speakers I have had the privilege to listen to, Madam Rubana Haq. <laughs> Madam Rubana Haq is the managing director of Mohammadi Group. She heads MG Properties, and is also the chairperson of Sharaf Memorial Trust. Her diversified portfolio also includes tech companies and power plants. Finally, I would like to call on stage my learned senior, senior advocate, Mr. Prabhini Yogi. <laughs> Sir will never accept this himself but he is widely recognized as one of the leading figures in civil and constitutional law in our country. <laughs> so much so that he's written not one but two indis indispensable treatises, practitioners' handbooks, one on the Specific Relief Act and the other constitutional law on constitutional law with one of the finest legal minds in our country, our late revered Mr. Mahmoudul Islam. So the aim for my panel discussion, for this panel discussion, will be to learn from our esteemed panelist, industry expert, Madam Huck, on the type of legal issues and disputes that she faces or her company faces uh, in her experience uh, in Bangladesh, and then have these issues discussed by our learned legal experts so that we can find out how these issues should, should or would be um, adjudicated in our courts. In, I know we are in constraint of time, but we, if we do get to it, we would also like to hear our learned uh, legal experts' opinions on how the law should be developed 
in this sector, particularly in light of the widening scope of Article 102.2 and their views on the ease of or our performance, our country's performance in the ease of doing business guide. I will now move. Madam, if I may begin with you. I know from my one conversation with you that the Mohammadi group has huge goodwill in the industry. Yet, in your long experience, if you can share with us some of the legal issues and disputes that your many companies have faced or your other companies that you know of have faced in Bangladesh. Thank you, Anita, for having given me the honor to come here. I'm, I'm not from law at all, so I have no idea what you're all talking about and, and to all the articles that you're referring to, but I can talk about my personal experience as, as a corporate entity. Uh, one is uh, we, have, we have garments, we have power plants, we have real estate, we have television channel, we have digital distribution, and we have software companies. So we face disputes almost everywhere and contractual obligations in, in almost all of these areas um, are very hazy and very dicey. One, as a manufacturer of garments, if you only knew what uncertainties we go through, you'll be actually shocked and appalled. There was, once upon a time, we used to have LCs, master LCs given by, uh, by customers. Not anymore. At least most of us do LC business just based on pure printed contracts, which have no legal bindings. It's all done on faith. So we basically have contracts given by the companies saying, we will pay you in such and such date, 120 days, 90 days deferred, whatever. And uh, you go ahead with this piece of paper to your bank, which we do. So we take it to our local banks, we present that paper. And the banks, because of our goodwill, allows us to more or less, you know, they honor the contract. And what they do is they give us the limit to uh, to operate and also to open back-to-back -back LCs. So basically, the local bank is taking um, everything on, on its shoulder and is actually providing me finance so that I can open back-to-back -back LC for the suppliers who are basically based in China or in India or Timbuktu, for all that matters. And they can basically take us for a spin if they want to. Um, they can ship faulty fabric in spite of having pre-shipment inspection certificates. And we will have nothing to do. Most of them do business with uh, LC at site. So while our customers give us just a piece of paper, we have to give solid back-to-back -back LCs to our suppliers. Just a quick uh, reference to, um, to BHS, um, a high street brand which, which actually went bankrupt last, week, last uh, year. A million pounds was held up by BHS. We couldn't do anything. So we negotiated through our friends in London who got us 80 cents to a pound. And, you know, it's, it's what I'm trying to say is in our business, everything is done in faith. And we are so worried about the settlement period. We always want to um, settle it ASAP. So we often don't take recourse of law. So what we don't do is, I should have probably contacted a lawyer in Britain and said, how can I be represented? I didn't do that because it would take a lot of money, and a lot of time, instead I negotiated. So very often, um, what we do is we look for shortcuts because we're running out of time. So there's a huge dichotomy between time, uh, the, pressing of the, the, the pressing need of urgent settlement, and also by going to the lawyers. And also, very often, we don't find quick answers with you guys. <laughs> I mean, very luckily, we have, I have great lawyer friends who are always there to help us. But, you know, many things are done just uh, on the basis of faith. So, for a real estate company, very recently, um, somebody gave me, the, 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 the gentleman we were buying the land from, gave me a full power of attorney without even encashing my checks. So that gave me a lot of 
uh, good feeling. I kind of felt very good. And I asked him, I said, you haven't even encashed my checks here. Why are you giving me power of attorney? With which I can basically sell his property, do whatever. He said, I know you wouldn't do that. So I think the factor of I know you wouldn't do that applies to all of us who do business. There was a company, I will not mention their name, for our power plant. Uh, basically, we opened the LC and the engines underperformed. We ended up with a 300 crore debt with the government be, because we consumed more diesel. And I ju we just couldn't do anything. And my husband was alive then. And, and he said, you know, let's not go into any hassle. Let's just negotiate and see what is the best we can do. So the company suffered a 300 crore, uh, literally a, a, a slap, because one, power, one, one supplier just took us out for a spin. So there are bad people, there are good people. There are bad businessmen, there are good businessmen. You know, there are great lawyers and there are not so good lawyers. <laughs> so, so, you know, what, what we need to do is, I think, uh, for all our sakes, we need to all come together and, uh, and find a common ground where we will find quick answers to our problems. And if Bangladesh could be represented with better uh, legal clout, you know, for corporate law, we really need instant answers, instant help, so that uh, people in India, I mean, there have been a lot of companies in India which have um, literally not paid many of the suppliers in Bangladesh, garment companies. So, you know, this shouldn't happen. Most of the times we are looking at uh, contracts um, through our own eyes, applying our own logic and common sense, which is really not fair. So, um, just to, just to tell you a story, uh, when my daughter was getting married, you know that horrible cabin nama that we have, where it says everything against the daughter. So I was very worried. Uh, and I said, what if my son-in-law takes advantage of her uh, intellectual property rights? I mean, she's, she's pretty good. She thinks very sharply. I said, no matter what he does, he should never be able to claim anything that she um, she actually, uh, yeah, if, if she pitches something, sh it should be on. I didn't know my son-in-law that well then, so I didn't <laughs> trust him enough. Now I do, but seriously, I wrote the whole thing down in Bangla, impeccable Bangla, and I said, Then my husband looked at me and said, are you mad? It's, <laughs> it's faith. It's, uh, it's faith that you embark on. It's, it's a great journey. So I think in business, if we do business with faith, with our buyers, with our suppliers, uh, I think we shouldn't do bad. Just one correction before I end. Bangladesh, uh, well, there are 190 countries, not 180. You said 180. Number two, Rashad said 179, which is all, uh, 189, which is also not the truth because it's only on contractual obligations where Bangladesh is, is standing at 189. Overall ranking of Bangladesh is 177. And thank you. We should not be talking about ease of doing business because we know that there, has been, there have been lots of scandals I think the chief economist of World Bank, Romero, apologized in January because of the Chile rate ratings. So I don't think we should take ease of doing business by World Bank as, uh, as really a great factor. I mean, I, I refuse to go by it anyway. Thank you. If I may pose uh, the, the first question to Honorable Mr. Justice, Mr. Mizo Hussain Haider. Sir, would you first off have any comments on the uh, statements made by Madam Hart? Uh, thank you very much. And to everybody, Assalamu Alaikum. Anita, you have invited me, though I am not totally fit. Even then I have come because I cannot say no to such a program which deals with the legal fraternity of our country. First of all, I will say, Rashad has given all the questions as well as all the answers. <laughs> he has raised various questions and along with that, the answers he has given is fantastic. About what uh, Ms. Hawk said on the question of this fraternity about this 
commercial contracts she has given the i think she has given the correct picture of our country if i know and if i go back to my early days of practice well back in 1979 i think change in this legal arena has been a lot in those days the backlog of cases were not much as it is now but this solving the problems by alternate dispute resolution is i think i think a time to step taken by the government as well as she said that instead of going to the court or taking assistance of london friend london lawyer friends they have taken some steps in respect of resolving the disputes i think time is very ripe nowadays to solve all these problems with this alternate dispute resolution i was thinking while richard was giving the statistics as to backlog of cases as well as the data that we are 189th out of 190 i was just asking to learn it senior advocate mr pravin yogi that why do we look forward only towards the high court division under the deed jurisdiction why the question is nowadays we are finding the lower judiciary is burdened with not thousands lakhs of cases if not billions but only thing i would i would suggest let all of us read cpc as it is as of now and if we take steps according to the procedural law that is the civil procedure code i think many of the suits could be sorted out at the very very inception of filing of it if you don't take it otherwise when we were young lawyers lawyers we were told by our seniors don't take each and every case judge the papers go through the papers study the law and if only 50% chance is there then take the case i think with all respect to everybody nowadays we have forgotten this we are coming with each and every case to the court immaterial whether it will be ultimate it will get the ultimate success or not this trend must be stopped until the procedural law is totally amended up to the standard up to now it is need but even then when i was a student of law in dhaka university my teacher late lamented mr akkas ali one of the most renowned civil lawyers in dhaka court he used to teach us cpc he used to say this book is such a thing if you lose a cow you will find it we used to say sir how could it be to follow the law cpc has given each and every step by which even a suit which is not maintainable can be sorted out and can be dismissed at the very inception of it that will prevent backlog of cases with what i believe 
Now, if we say that lower, lower judiciary is completely overburdened with cases and it takes 1442 days to dispose of a case, and that is why I will come to the High Court, then within the next 10 years will be more than 1442 cases, 42 days to dispose of a single case. Rishad pointed out a case conducted by his senior, Mr. Akhtar Imam, in the appellate division, which is pending for last 30 years. When the matter was placed, it was my fort I was fortunate to hear his argument. But unfortunately, the judgment could not be delivered because the bench has already, bench is no more there. And he started this case saying, the legacy of legal system. I remember very well, it's a contract of supplying wheat and detergent, DDT. And that contract was entered in 1980. Sorry, prior to that, the case was instituted in 1980. And unfortunately, that case lingered till date and it has not been disposed of. But question is, my question is, why? Is it the fault of the judiciary alone? Is it the fault of the court alone? Or should we not take the responsibility as a whole? May I ask in this floor to Mr. Akhtar Imam, how many times you mentioned this case or took steps to get this case hard and disposed of? I'm not putting an example, I'm just putting an example saying Mr. Imam who is present here. This is the picture and the scenario what we are facing both from amongst the members of the bar as well as the members in the bench. We cannot avoid responsibility and shrug it off from my shoulder. With the lawyer, first of all, we shall have to think, because I am saying, because I had 21 years of practice as a lawyer, and now I have almost 18 years as a judge. I have seen both sides of the coin. My earnest request to you all, let us not discuss about the backlog. Let us find it out, how to solve it out, how to sort it out. And for that purpose, we, all of us, we require our wholehearted common effort. Let us sort it out. What are the cases which are not at all maintainable? You can do it. We can do it collectively. When I was in the High Court Division, for a long time I was looking after the customs cases. I volunteered to the then Chief Justice. I will see it in the, in the, in the, during the vacation, along with anyone who volunteers with me, to sort out how many customs cases are, are to be decided. Because principle has already been set. Only you just put the case on the track and just dispose of. There is no necessity of delivering lengthy judgment in each and every case. That's why there was a trend once that template judgments should be written. Of course, that is not the solution. To me, template judgment if it is written, then will it be justified to each and every case? I would say no. Because each and every case has got its own facts and circumstances. Obviously, to some extent, each and every case will vary from the other. That is why template judgment is not the solution. My only request to every one of us let us give a wholehearted effort to 
come out of this backlog with our own effort and find it out. If my case, which I have filed, is not maintainable, let us be honest and say to the court, my lord, I have got nothing to say in this case. Let it be disposed of. At least one case will come out of a one million cases. Today, appellate division is having probably, if I am not correct, more than a lakh, probably. High court division is overburdened with more than three or four lakhs. And whole country, you can imagine, this is a burden upon each and every one of us who are in this legal fraternity. This burden must be resolved, must be sent off from our shoulder. Now, with Rubana, I would say, Ms. Rubana has correctly said, towards the lawyer friends, or the legal system, we have tried to solve out all these problems through negotiation. That is not all, and that is not the end of it. Sometimes arbitration may be taken to the court, and again it starts the same procedure. I always say, and today also I would say, let us do one thing. Let me do the, right, the duty what I have to the hilt. My duty towards my state, towards my nation, towards my society must be concluded by me. Absolutely. And if each one of us do it, I think this backlog of cases probably will no more be there because we shall have to be honest to our own duties and responsibilities. This negotiation is very good because in each and every cases nowadays we are seeing government is coming up with alternate dispute resolution, ADR. But sometimes that also comes, for com comes up with difficulties even then, let us try, let us give a hope, and let us give a boost up to all this procedure, what we are facing this. I wish if we honestly deal with all these things, probably by next 10, 20 years, we will be updated. About the appellate division, I, say, I can say, we have concluded civil petitions up to almost uh, uh, up to 2016. True, but 2017 and 18 is coming. I do not know how to dispose of all these cases. But appeals, I am sorry, we couldn't conclude up to 2013 even. So every year we are. Over, we are being overburdened with cases. I think introduction to this would be proper to your answer, Anita. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So, thank you. Based on Sir's very pertinent comments on all of us working towards a common goal of reducing the burden of the court and also what Ma Madam Huck said about working in good faith to reduce, to make sure that this enforcement of contracts issue issues do not get to court and they have been successful in that. We are reminded of uh, a quote by our late revered senior Mahmoud al-Islam sir which is actually here in a bookmark in all of your files if I may be allowed to read this out. Mr. Mahmoud Islam sir wrote in his book that there is an old adage that if man is good, law is unnecessary. But if man is bad, law cannot cope with it. 
Though this statement is oversimplified, the essential truth that comes out of it is that there is no substitute to character. If majority of the people have faith in law and comply with its mandates, the law can cope with the infraction of law by the few. I will place my next question to Mr. Prabhin Yogi, sir. Sir, in the constraints of, uh, facing constraints of time, I will jump into a very legalistic question for you. Sir, and that question is, Rishad has already traced the law for us from Sharping to Asad Zaman Shikdar. It is my failing, sir, that I actually seem to get confused by the time we come from Sharping to Conforce versus Titaj Gas to BTL to Asad Zaman Shikdar. I hope I'm not the only one here who's a little bit confused. So, sir, if I may ask you to explain what exactly the development of the law was and how far this realm has been opened up in the Asad Zaman Shikdar case. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the question because our topic is or was enforcement of contracts or contractual rights and obligation invoking writ jurisdiction. And possibly for the backlog of cases, enforcement of contract in writ jurisdiction has become more than a madding crowd. And up to this, we are far from the madding crowd. Has in keynote presentation, what Reshat presented. Beyond that, I am thankful to Anita for this relevant question. What is the development from Sharping to Asad Ujjaman? In fact, there is no fundamental difference between Sharping and Asad Ujjaman. In when it came against cancellation of contract, it was a lease of fishery. And when matter came to the High Court Division, first concern for the court was maintainability of the proceeding. Because we know there are law relating to contracts, contract act, and law for enforcement of contract, that is, Specific Relief Act. Specific Relief Act provides enforcement of contract and also provides rescission of contracts. Here it was found that this contract, though leasing of a fishery, but government entered into this contract. Contracting party, one party was writ petitioner, the lessee and another party was deputy commissioner on behalf of the president of the republic. And subject matter of the contract was lease of a fishery, which according to section 22A of State Acquisition and Tenancy Act is non-retainable land. When abolition of jamindari system by State Acquisition and Tenancy Act, some lands were categorized as retainable land and some were non-retainable land. Fisheries were, open fisheries were non-retainable land. And under another provision of State Acquisition and Tenancy Act, that is section 76 of State Acquisition and Tenancy Act, government was authorized, empowered to dispose of the lands vested in the government either by you of sale, by you of lease, by you of granting license to some person. So, the contract for leasing out a fishery was a contract entered into by the government in exercise of its statutory power. So, court held government here acted in entering into contract not as a mere trading contracting party. Government here acts as a government. 
in exercise of its sovereign power. And it was followed in subsequent cases. And what is, what is sovereign power? It's a vast domain, but to make it very simple, we can say sovereign power is the power to enact and enforce laws. Ultimately, it comes as a definition of sovereign power. And to enact and enforce laws, you know, enforcing laws is a very broad spectrum subject. And we will come across many statutes. Some sections of those statutes confers the government and sometimes the uh, local authority, statutory public authorities as agent of the government, some powers. And when in exercise of those powers, government or local authorities, statutory public authorities enter into contract. Those are contracts in exercise of sovereign power. So, it was the rationale of Sharping case. When government in entering into contract acted as a government, acts as a government by discharging its statutory or governmental or sovereign functions, sovereign powers, then in case of, a case of any breach of the contract, the aggrieved party may invoke writ jurisdiction. And what is in Asadujjaman Shikdar case? Everything same. Only one new point was there, arbitration clause. In lease agreement in Sharping case, arbitration clause was not there and it, did not, it was not raised, it was not answered. But in um, Power Development Board versus Asadujjaman Shikdar, arbitration clause was there and arbitration clause was pleaded as a bar to invoke writ jurisdiction by the respondents. And it was held in the in Asadujjaman Shikdar case, in possibly in paragraph 11, there was a formula, formula enumerated in A to G or something like that. And court enumerated that which are statutory contracts it was answered that when terms and conditions of the contracts are rooted in a statute. As we have already discussed section 76 of State Acquisition and Tenancy Act, there are in PDB Act, there are in Telecommunication Act, there are in Energy Regulatory Commission Act, powers are conferred upon government or upon some statutory authority. And when in order to exercise those powers, in order to discharge obligations cast by those law, government or statutory body enters into a contract, that is statutory contract. And it has been clearly answered in Asadujjaman Shikdar case. Government, water development body is a statutory body, Dhaka City Corporation is a statutory body, enters into a contract for getting supply of paper stationery. Or a department of the government enters into a contract for construction of a building where the office of Dhaka City Corporation will be located. As Madam's organization is now looking for co uh, contract, uh, contractors for raising BGMEA building in Uttara. Those contracts, even if entered into by the government or local, local authority are not statutory contracts. Those are plain and simple trading contracts or commercial contracts. So, the main distinguishing feature is that, first of all, party to the contract, whether the respondents against which 
contract is sought to be enforced is government government functionary or local authority or statutory public authority or some companies may be there you know against titas this question arose jo hoye dar against titas weak petition is maintainable it was found that bangladesh oil gas and mineral corporation ordinance section 10 provided that corporation may sponsor subsidiary companies and may held its interest in the companies so it was held that the subsidiary companies like titash bakrabat these have no corporate character in no independent corporate character like our madam rubana hawks companies companies of her group these companies are absolutely controlled by statutory corporation so the employee of etitas gas or bakrabat they are as good as employees of petro bangla so they can maintain the petition so i don't think there is a, any basic difference between the rationale of asaduzzaman sikdar or sharpin both are same and arbitration clause is always a bar even for civil litigation if in a contract arbitration clause is there you say that if you go to enforce the contract by invoking civil courts jurisdiction court will not entertain the suit section 7 of arbitration act 2001 the court no court will proceed with a suit on the in a sub, on a subject matter in respect of which arbitration clause is there and if the after getting notice other side of the suit appears before the court and files an uh, application the court will refer the matter to arbitration so arbitration is a bar for even proceeding with civil suit and for to enforce contracts if arbitration clause is there arbitration clause equally a bar in uh, to enforce uh, contracts in writ jurisdiction it has to be exhausted first and i uh, i don't think we have much time in hand another point i want to uh, mention here 1021 reshad pointed out it that in case of fundamental violation of fundamental rights court will not say the whether there is so there was any alternative efficacious remedy and the petitioner has exhausted it if the petitioner prime officer can establish that there has been violation of fundamental right then court will embark upon the matter to see it. even there are decision of pakistan supreme court the so we know in very general words we say that in writ jurisdiction evidence cannot be taken so no disputed question can be adjudicated in writ jurisdiction no not matter is not like that simple evidence is taken in writ jurisdiction but these are particular type of evidence that is affidavit evidence but if it is needed to take oral evidence or if it is needed to take some oral evidence which can be based be had on the spot as for example in civil court only evidence on dog sometimes do not do we need local investigation those evidence cannot be taken into its jurisdiction even then in his book of our late lamented senior mahmud islam he has said if a petitioner who has come to the high court division to enforce his fundamental right if he can prime officer establish that there has been a breach of fundamental right it is not at the discretion of the court that court may or may not court has to adjudicate the matter and if necessary court has to take evidence appointing commission and it was appointed in earlier days in past days in our jurisdiction because up to 1971 pakistan so, jurisdiction of pakistan supreme court is proceedings or decision of our jurisdiction it it is there
and it is also mentioned in the book Sarsiorari by late lamented our grand senior Surat Ishtiyak Ahmed. That when fundamental right is asked and it is prima facie, petitioner has been able to make out a case of breach of fundamental right, it is no longer a matter of court's discretion. Court has to investigate into the matter, if necessary, by taking evidence. Possibly time is over. <laughs> so, thank you all. A very good afternoon to everybody. And a very, very big thanks to Anita Gaji Rahman, Rashna Imam, Karishma Jahan, Reshad Imam, and all others of legal circle team. Think, 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 think legal team. Think legal team. Thank you, everybody. We have run out of time. Our, my research assistant for this panel, Shonchita Siddiq, and I spent the last one month coming up with four pages of questions. And uh, we have been able to ask one each. So uh, I know we have run out of time, but I would still like to open the floor with your permission, esteemed panelists, for five minutes for questions. Is that okay? The first question from the Honorable Dr. Justice Sayyid Rifat Ahmed. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Prabhupada Yogi. My question is to you. Um, the, uh, this is a purely uh, a, a very uh, objective uh, evaluation of the Abdul Hakim case. But the, uh, the point that was mooted before the court in that case and which sort of struck a chord with the court was that in matters of governance in the present day and age, increasingly private enterprises, private bodies operate in the public realm, in the public domain. They t assume and take on the functions that any public authority would otherwise uh, discharge. Education, health, and the works. And it also happens additionally that in discharging these uh, functions in the public domain, providing a public service, albe albeit in a private capacity, these private bodies come to be regulated under a legal regime at the, at the top of the hierarchical uh, realm by a public statutory body. And it is in that context we see uh, the, the, the rise of a genre of, of, of responsibilities where the distinction between a provision of a service or a decision by a public authority is blurred. Because it's a decision of a private authority made in a public domain controlled by a public authority. Where do you see this line of thinking uh, and reasoning going? Do you see it being stopped in the tracks because of the fact that we have another overriding concern that we don't want to open the floodgates on the Article 102 and we must, you know, um, stem this at the outset? Or do you think that, you know, dispensation of justice requires that we broaden the scope of writ, a relief under writ, and expand on the availability of that remedy? Thank you. I am working on Abdul Hakim's case. <laughs> oh, possibly more than a week, and Anita gave me the judgment. And this is very, very important in our present day working system of the government as well as private enterprises. Because apart from this, very often, very often we come across cases when some employee come to the court, some employee of a statutory body, he can come. But pleadings of the respondent becomes that no, we are getting his service by outsourcing. So we have no responsibility regarding his employment or tenure of employment, etc. This is like that Abdul Hakim case. When the government 
goes for outsourcing. Government provides some public services which are supposed to be provided by public bodies, hiring private bodies. But nature of the service provided is public services, which is supposed to be provided by the public bodies or by the government. So, in that view of the matter, Hakim, Abdul Hakim's case is a, an eye-opener for all of us because read to jurisdiction is an ever-widening jurisdiction. Because only a decade or a decade and a half back, we very often, yes, inferior tribunal has committed this mistake. But it is not jurisdictional mistake, jurisdictional error. So we cannot interfere. But now we know there is no distinction between jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional error. Whenever an inferior tribunal or executive authority goes wrong in law, it goes wrong in jurisdiction. Whenever it steps outside law, it steps outside jurisdiction. So in that view of the matter, I am working a bit seriously on Abdul Hakim case and I think everybody should work and think in this line and uh, from one of my experience, it is legitimate expectation. In 1902 or 93, I had opportunity to conduct a case and then it's some land of a retired civil surgeon was acquired for DOHS and some sort of oral promise was there that they will be provided a plot and I moved but High Court Division, a division bench observed that we hope that government will not, will not throw the lady and her kids on the street whose husband served the government for many years. And they, act after with the judge, copy of the judgment, applied to the president, then Justice Shahabuddin was the president. And he marked it for a, a cantonment, military estate. It came down, came down, and then one senior assistant secretary, he told, what is there? Has the High Court Division directed us to provide you land? No. But that boy <laughs> was behind it, years of Tarian. And they got a, an alternative plot in original DOHS, Mohakali DOHS. And now its structure has also erected their own. If it would be a case of today or five years back, I think High Court Division applying doctrine of legitimate expectation would issue and direction. So it is an ever increasing and ever widening jurisdiction. And Abdul Hakim case, judgment in Abdul Hakim case is eye opener for all of us. Thank you. Rifat Ahmed said that somehow or other we seem to be afraid of opening the floodgates. If justice demands that floodgates be open, let it be. Yes. This is all in the interest of justice. Here, if there is a, an opening there for anybody to invoke that, by all means he should be allowed to do it. Just because it may open the floodgates, so long as it is for a good cause, let this be open. Thank you, sir. I am grateful to you, sir, for posing this question. Because when a litigant, a petitioner come to the court, court will converge all its attention to the merit of that case. If the merit of the case deserves to the relief prayed for, it has to be given without extending court's concern beyond the case. Whether it will open floodgate or it will shut down the door of justice. Both may happen. I am grateful to you, sir.
Thank you, sir. To this, I would like to add one thing. That is, on each and every day, we are facing different questions. We are facing different problems. And that is why, since long, we have already decided in several cases that equality, discrimination, fraud, arbitrariness, malafide, and along with this, legitimate expectation. These are the six sectors, I should say, which are always open to everybody. Everybody. Because Justice Shabuddin said, fraud vitiates everything. And similarly, question of equality is a wide and vast question. Discrimination is a very vast question to be proved that I have been discriminated. Malafide, it has to be alleged and proved. And along with this, we need to do all these things in our pleadings and along with that, we need to prove it. So, the question of all these six aspects are to be pleaded along with it, are open for discussion as well as open for judicial review. It cannot be shut down by simply saying that will overburden the High Court Division. It cannot. It will and it is the honorable judges as well as the learned members of the bar to find out which is the actual thing. Sharping gave us one thing that is statutory contract and Asaduddin Shikdar has given a, a bit wider scope that statutory contract could be termed when the public authority works under the statute. This, has, this is the achievement and the development between these two cases. That is why we need to say this is never ending process. Judiciary and field of law is never ending process. We shall have to exercise and we shall have to find out what is the conclusion of it. But I doubt whether we can conclude by saying no. It will remain open for discussion and for debating and for judicial review and other things. Thank you very much. We will take one more question, but before that I believe Madam Huck has something to add to this conversation. I'm not from law, but something that I'm going to say is probably going to go against private sector. So, uh, Sir Prabhupada was talking about uh, the, pub the public outsourcing from the private. Um, one thing is very, very clear now. Uh, when outsourcing is done, uh, public often lacks uh, to wear the lenses of objectivity. That is because most of the, th there's an anomaly. Most of the private sector is now into, um, into the areas of policy making. I think this should be this should be very, very clear. Those of us who are in private practices, who, those who are in corporate entities, should not go into politics unless we think that we'll be able to severe our connections with our businesses formally. Because um, just giving you, you know, the country is having a, well, the banks are having difficulty. And you will not believe the, the bad debt, the volume of bad debt, is much lesser than bad credit volume. And, you know, we are the ones who are manipulating it. So, post Rana Plaza, when only the buyers got together and put pressure on us and said, hey, we are not going to buy from you, if you don't remediate, we remediated. 90% of our factories have remediated in five years. Where is the pressure from the governments to make us all follow or abide by the rule of law? So between the public and the private, the judiciary must step in and must, must, must make sure that policy makers, even if they are from, if they are represented by us, should not take advantage of the current situation, uh, of, of whatever is going on now, right now. So it has to be a transparent landscape. Judiciary must step in and must play its role. Otherwise, 
we will not be uh, we will not be looking uh, we won't have a better tomorrow with our with our next generation so thanks sakib is waving his hands at me saying no more we need to finish so bhai i know you raise your hands up but instead of asking a question can i ask you to tell us what you thought of this panel and then we can leave no i think that is a privilege and honor for me and i i, I my thing was actually not a question but to draw attention of you also including uh, think legal i think in future um, um, i'm advocate my name is uttam das uh, i mainly work in the employment and Uh, labor law issues so in future uh, you have three uh, five or six panels so i think one panel should be on the employment and labor matters uh, given the you know importance of the uh, country so uh, i'm drawing attention of niyogi sir especially and uh, rashid was uh, mentioning about uh, uh, commercial contract and other matters in violation of that the jurisdiction in recent year from indian supreme court especially there are series of judgment on employment contracts we have a you know traditional thinking that employment contract is between private entities corporation and uh, uh, individual and it should be guided by contract law but indian supreme court has some landmark judgment for example when there are gross violation of fundamental rights like uh, uh, you know lawfully not notified or uh, even they go they went beyond also social security also so if somebody is uh, retrains or terminated without you know Uh, following the legal provisions even individual can go through the read jurisdiction also and from indian supreme court there are so many you know uh, decisions so far so i, I was just drawing attention that uh, the read jurisdiction in uh, several you know countries have uh, beyond commercial contract also so maybe in future we will have more uh, time to discuss on that matters thank you thank you <laughs> Thank you sir with your support inshallah we will Thank you Thank you everyone